Today I want to talk to you about following the pattern. And when I speak about pattern, I, I speak of pattern in the sense of a model or a template. When I was younger, my father bought an old Singer sewing machine for my mother. It looked just about like this. It was in a, a cabinet. It had a little top that went on top of it. And you could put it and carry it places. It wasn't one of the treadle machines. It wasn't quite that old. It had an electric motor. And she bought some, and I remember they were specifically simplicity patterns at the time, that's what she bought. And she made her own dresses for a few years. You know, as Christians, as Christians, we have a pattern. We have a pattern to live and to follow after, and that pattern is Jesus Christ. Christ is the ladder that is led down in our path today, and that reaches to the battlements of heaven, to the very threshold of glory. Now the question is, will you climb the ladder? Jesus Christ is our pattern, the great standard of moral character. Will you follow his example, or will you choose to follow the example and practice and customs of the world? Bible Echo, November 19, 1894, paragraph 4. We've all heard the, the little state, statement, you know, or the, the acronym uh, WWJD, what would Jesus do? We ask that question because we believe Christ is our pattern. Christ is the one that we look after. We don't look to a, a minister or a preacher or a deacon or a church group or anyone. We are to look to Christ. He is our pattern. He is the great moral standard in everything. And when we think about following Christ, you know, we're to follow in his footsteps. He who is the way, the truth, and the life. And we could look at many branches or aspects of following Christ, but today I want to talk a little bit about following Christ in the sense that we are to be servants because Christ came to be a servant. In um, Luke chapter 22 and verse 27, Jesus said, I am among you as he that serveth. I am among you as he that serveth. Now, if you think about the time of, that Christ was living, the Jews at that time, they expected the Messiah would come as a king, and he would be served as a king. But Christ was the counterexample of what the people expected, and even what they wanted, if you please. Christ's servanthood was an expression of subservience and humility and was an integral aspect of his relationship with God. And I'd like to say that I believe that as we as followers of Christ, that servanthood should also be an expression of our subservience and our humility and should be an integral aspect of our relationship with God. As you think about great men of the Bible, great men of the Bible have always been servants in some form or another. The Bible tells us that Abraham was a man of great wealth. In Genesis 14, 14, it tells us that he had 318 servants. Well, that's a lot of servants. I don't know about you, but I, I couldn't hardly keep up with two or three servants. I couldn't keep five or ten people busy. Abraham had 318 of them. That's a lot, friends. And in Genesis 18, we have a story of where the Lord and some angels visited Abraham. And I want you to notice as we read through the, just a portion of this story in Genesis 18 about how Abraham truly was a servant. In verses 1 through 3, it says, And the Lord appeared unto him, that is Abram, in the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, what did he do? He ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself down toward the ground. He didn't wait for them to come to him first. He went out to see them. He ran even to them. He bowed down, showing he is willing to be a servant, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from what? Thy servant. Had he ever met these people before, at least in this form? No. He had no indication that these were supernatural beings or, or messengers from heaven. At this point, he just assumes they are three human beings just like him. But he bows down to these people and he says, let me be your servant. Verse 4. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Verse 5. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts, 
after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou said. Again, he says, I'm your what? I'm your servant. Verse 6. And Abram hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quick three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. Verse 7. And Abram ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man and he hastened to dress it. He got help, didn't he? He got some help. He got help from this young man. He got some help from Sarah. But he was trying to do his part. It says, And he took butter and milk and the calf which he addressed and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. This, this great man, Abraham, you know, the, the Jews, they said that they, they look back to Father Abraham as being the father of their race and he was a servant. He was a servant. And even though he had not, he had not the record of the gospels that we have, we have the record of the gospels today that tells about the servanthood of Christ, right? But by faith, he understood something about the Messiah, and he understood something about how his relationship should be to mankind and to others, and that he was going to walk as he knew that his Savior would walk. In Psalms 105 and verse 42, Psalms 105 and verse 42, it says, For he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his what? Servant. servant. Abraham was his servant. And you know, Abraham had a special steward, a special steward. In Genesis 15 and verse 5, and I'm bringing this up for a reason. Genesis 15, did I say 5? I meant 15 too. Genesis 15 too. It says, And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is Eliezer Damascus? And the Hebrew word is interesting. The Hebrew word for steward is, is a different kind of word here than the Hebrew word for steward in the, uh, in the New Testament. When you read about stewards in the New Testament, deacons were stewards. They were people who helped, people who assisted. But this Hebrew word for steward means son of inheritance. Son of inheritance. Son of inheritance. And so Abraham had this special servant, his son of inheritance. But, but, but this servant, this servant was quite a servant. Because if Abraham died, died childless, all his possessions would go to Eleazar. But he sends Eleazar on a, on, a, on a mission and a special burden. What was that special mission? To find a wife for his daughter Isaac, or for his son Isaac, and because he'd had a son uh, later on. And Eleazar is not jealous of Isaac. He goes and finds a wife and, and brings her back, Rebecca, and, and anyhow. There's an interesting insight I found in a devotional book called This Day That I Might Know Him on page 220. In this devotional book, it says this, A steward identifies himself with his master. His master's inheritance become his. He has accepted the responsibilities of a steward, and he must act in the master's stead, doing as the master would do if he were presiding over his own goods. The position is one of dignity in that his master trusts him. If a steward in any wise acts selfishly and turns the advantages gained in trading with his Lord's good goods to his own advantage, he has perverted the trust reposed in him. The master can no longer look upon him as a servant to be trusted, one on whom he can depend. Mm. Think about it, friends. God makes us servants, but he makes us stewards. Stewards in the sense of being servants. And he does it because he can trust us. And he wants to trust us and he wants to use us for his end. Another great man in the Old Testament was Moses. Moses. And we could read many verses about Moses, but I'm just going to recap it here with one verse in Deuteronomy 34 and verse 5. Deuteronomy 34, verse 5. He says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. He calls him the servant. You know, interesting, when you read through the book of Joshua, I found at least 11 times in the book of Joshua, that Moses is called a servant of God. At least 11 times that I could find. In 2 Kings 18.12, 2 Chronicles 1.3, Hebrews 3.5, Revelation 15.3, all these references speak about Moses being a servant of God. This is the one great quality about Moses. This man who was the meekest man of the earth, he was a servant. 
And I think it would be hard to find a man more accountable as a servant in the Bible than Moses, with, of course, the exception of Christ. And it's interesting because Moses gave a prophecy about Christ in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 18. In Deuteronomy 18, 18, I'll give you time to turn there, please. But there he says, I will raise up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now, who is this great prophet that he's speaking about here? Jesus Christ. All right. Now, Christ is called a prophet. He's, he's called uh, an apostle in Hebrews 3.1. But he served the role of a prophet, didn't he? Because a prophet is a, someone who speaks for God. Christ came. He is the Word of God. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, right? He is the very embodiment of the thoughts of God to us. And, and, and he says that I'm going to raise up a prophet like unto thee. And even though he gives him his words, I, I think that one of the greatest qualities about this relationship between Moses and Christ is their servanthood, their servanthood. Moses was a great servant. He could have commanded much for himself. Instead, he accepted the abuse and the use of those people of Israel for 40 years, and yet he continued to serve them. He continued to plead for them when God was ready to cast them off. And Christ is a servant. He is a servant also in this sense. The Bible speaks of Joshua as being a servant. In Judges 2 and verse 8. Judges 2, 8. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. You know, if, if time goes on long enough, or if something happens to me before the Lord's coming and I die, the greatest thing that could ever be said about me was, he was a servant of the Lord. Amen. I don't need anything else. If I can just be called by God, his servant, that will be enough for me. David is referred to as a servant over 16 times in the Bible. For example, in Psalms 89 and verse 3, he says, I've made a covenant with my chosen. I've sworn unto David, my servant. And in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke, he is called his servant. Luke 1, 69. And so let's think about Jesus as being a servant for a little bit. His teachings on servanthood. You know, one of the most basic fundamental things that Jesus taught was that we cannot have a divided loyalty. There's a lot of people in the world today who want to have the Lord and they want to have the world too. They want to have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. But in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, Jesus, Jesus gave us a strict warning against this kind of thinking because it just cannot work. It doesn't work. Jesus says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God in anything else, friends. You can't have a divided loyalty. If you're going to be a servant, you have to be a servant to God, a love slave to God and to Christ. And I made a reference to Luke 22 earlier, and I'd like to just share that in its context right now. Luke 22, if you turn there with me, and verses 24 through 27, because it says, There was also a strife among them. This, the, the timing of this is near the end of the ministry of Christ on this earth. His passion is just before him. And there was a strife among his disciples. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? Now that wouldn't happen to any of us here today, would it? None of us would ever decide we want to be greater than another, would we? We wouldn't do that, would we? And he said unto them, verse 25, The kings of the Gentiles, or the nations, the, the, the word Gentile is, is ethnos. We get our word ethnic from it. But remember, in the, in the Jewish mind, there were fundamentally two groups of people. There were the Jews and the Gentiles, the Jews and the nations. This word Gentiles that we translate Gentiles here is also translated nations in other places. So he says, the kings of the nations, the kings of the world, they exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called 
benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. This word greatest is from the Greek word mega, but uh, in the context it means older. He is the older because he's contrasting it with those who are younger. He that is older or the greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat. He says that's the way we commonly look at things. The one who's sitting at meat, getting served, he's the greater. But Jesus puts in a little conjunction there. But. But. That little word but changes things around. It puts usually a 180 degree spin on things. In this case, he says, but I am among you as he that serveth. The Lord of glory came to this earth worthy of all of our adoration and, and love and worship. And, and yet he didn't come to be served. He came to serve. And he is our pattern, friends. We haven't been put here to be pampered and privileged and to be treated well. We've came here to serve. As I noted earlier, this is the exact opposite of what most expect from a leader. Jesus called the disciples to rest, but there's no reference to him ever resting or taking a vacation. He spent all nights in prayer at times. I'm sure he needed rest. He was focused upon his task of sharing the love of the Father in every way that he could. Interestingly, someone has said that the most important lesson of great leadership is that leaders always work for the people. What makes a leader great is someone who works for the people. Their goal is to help others to be successful. Leadership doesn't mean status and hierarchy. Instead, leadership comes with the responsibility of allowing the ones you lead to rise, and leadership comes with sacrifice. It means service. Service to others. And you know, this can be done sometimes in the simplest ways, in ways that we might not imagine we can do. You know, I, I think of Sister Arlene, she's hearing my sermon now, and she's thinking, you know, Pastor Allen, I love you, but I'm 97 years old, and I can't do much to help too many people anymore. But you know, friends, sometimes just a smile can uplift our spirits and can change our attitudes. It's amazing what just little things that we do at times can be done. On March the 30th of 1981, President Ronald Reagan was almost fatally shot in an attempt on his life. And uh, he was taken to George Washington Hospital, emergency room, to the trauma center there. And of course, there's just a, a whole bunch of people there. And I, I've heard some of the testimonies of the doctors and nurses that worked on him, and, and almost to the person, they, they, were, they were pretty nervous. You know, this is the President of the United States. And uh, they were, this one lady, she, she was taking phone calls and she said she was shaking so bad she told this guy she says you have to help me I'm just shaking too much he says I can't help you have to do it yourself because I'm shaking too but it is said that just before the president was sedated for the surgery you know this the anesthesiologist says mr. president we're going to put you to sleep now he sensed their nervousness and he lifted up his head and he said to them I hope you all are Republicans <laughs> I hope all you people are Republicans, you know, and, you know, can you imagine just how it broke the, the nervousness of that group for that time? Um, one of the nurses remarked later, he had been shot and had the daylight scared out of him, and he wanted to put the people around him at ease. Isn't that interesting? So sometimes we might not think we can do a lot, but friends, sometimes just a little bit makes a lot. Some of us are obviously capable more. I was talking with someone the other day. I said, you know, when I get old, I won't be able to do these things anymore. <laughs> you know, and uh, well, you know, when I was younger, if, some, if I'd looked at someone my age, I thought that person's a fossil. They're ready to, to go under. But I, I remember being at, um, at Brother Todd Brown's a few weeks back and, 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 and Todd was out doing some mowing. I thought, I, I need to go over and do this mowing for him. Why should I let him mow? And I got to think, well, you know, Todd's young enough to be my son. Uh, maybe I should let him mow. Maybe it is his turn to mow. But, you know, that, that should be our attitude. Our attitude should be, you know, what can I do to help someone else? We should always be looking at what can I do to make someone else better. 
Jesus, shortly after he, he gave this, this, this statement that he is among you as one who serves, he showed that service in, in, in a very concrete way. In John 13, we read here about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And he said unto them, after this, he said in verse 13, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. I am your Master and Lord. Yes, this is true. I don't deny that. Verse 14. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example. In other words, I am a pattern for you to follow. Amen? I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happier if ye do them. Friends, Christ says he was sent of the Father. He says, my Father is greater than I. I've come to do my Father's will. He understood what it meant to be a servant. And we are to serve him. Jesus taught parables on servant, servanthood, such as the parable of the householder, the parable of the talents. And one of my favorite, the parable, if you please to call it this, of the unprofitable servant. In Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. And starting in verse 7. Matthew, Mark, Luke, third gospel in the New Testament. Jesus says, but which of you? But which of you? He brings it down to a personal level, doesn't it? He wants to bring us each to a decision about things. He says, but which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. He says, how many of you? Well, this is what everyone in that time would have done. You've got a servant in the field. He comes in. You don't tell him to go eat. You say, help me now. Take care of me. Says, That's what you do. He says in verse 9 now, Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. That word trow means I think not. I don't think so. In other words, I don't think so. He says, so likewise ye, when ye have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. How are we to look at ourselves? We're just unprofitable servants. Friends, we maybe went out all day and worked, you know, on, on the kitchen soup line or whatever it is, and we're just tired at the end of the day. And you know what? We've only done our duty at best. I mentioned to you about perhaps the greatest medical missionary ever outside of Christ. Who do you think I'm speaking about? I'm speaking about a, a man who stood up to preach for the first time. And he got up and he was so terrified and so afraid. He said, I've forgotten everything. I can't say anything. And he sat down. And a man who would later become his father-in-law told him, he says, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you should become a doctor instead. <laughs> no, maybe preaching isn't for you. But he learned to preach. He learned to become a doctor. His name was David Livingston. David Livingston. And uh, Livingston, we're probably somewhat familiar with his, his life and the things that he went through. Um, I, I remember reading a story about Livingston one time. He was quite sick. Um, he had a servant that was tending to him that he was sure Livingston would not live through the morning, that he was going to die. And uh, the servant uh, went to bed for a little bit, and he woke up in the morning, and he looked, and Livingston's gone. He's gone. And there was a note left on the table and said, there's a, there's a tribe somewhere in this particular direction. They haven't been reached with Christ yet. I'm going to, going to preach to them. <laughs> you know, he was sure he was dying the night before. Now he's went to preach. Well, Livingston said this. People talk of the sacrifice I've made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that be called a sacrifice which is simply paid back as a small part of the great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay? Is that a sacrifice which brings its own reward of healthy activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? And then he said, Away with such a word, such a view, and such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather, it is a privilege. It is 
emphatically no sacrifice, rather I say it is a privilege, anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then with the foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and sink, but let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall hereafter be revealed in us and for us. I never made a sacrifice. Of this we ought not to talk when we remember the great sacrifice which he made who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. And boy, I feel so ashamed now for being so glad we had air conditioning at Carousel. Mm -hmm. You know, it was no sacrifice. My land. Not at all. Well, I'll tell you more about him in a minute. In the New Testament, we have the followers of Christ now following his example. You know, in Joel chapter 2, it was prophesied, especially in verse 29, that God was going to pour out his spirit on his handmaidens and, maid, and, and, uh, and servants. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 28, we have a, a statement of this fulfillment. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. He says he's going to do this to his servants, friends. He doesn't, don't, don't expect to get the Holy Spirit poured out. Don't expect the latter rain, friends, if you're not going to be a servant. It's not going to happen. And this is how they saw themselves in Acts chapter 4 and verse 29. Acts 4, 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. You know, they've threatened us. They've kicked us out. They've put us in prison. They threaten us with death. Lord, give us boldness that we can be your servants. Give us boldness. In Jude 1, he simply says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. He calls himself a servant. Perhaps there was no servant greater in the New Testament than Paul. And Paul repeatedly called himself a servant. In Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be apostle. In Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, he speaks of Timotheus or Timothy with him. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, he says, For we preach not ourselves. Now notice this is what he's saying. Now this is important because he says he's a servant of Christ, but now he's going to explain a little bit about what it means to be a servant of Christ. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. In other words, the way I serve Christ primarily is by serving his people, by serving humanity, helping uh, someone else. As Jesus said one time, he said, you know, I'm going to separate the sheep and the goats. And the difference is that one group is going to be helping people. One group is going to be feeding the poor. They're going to be visiting those in prison. They're going to be doing those things, and the other group isn't. And that's what really determines the sheep and the goats. Now, I mentioned I would bring up something about Livingston a little bit later. But I want to tell you a story about someone else first. Because I'm going to tell you a story about the man who said you should be a doctor. Remember, someone said that you should be a doctor. So, several years ago, many years ago, there was a worship service in a little church, maybe about like this, and uh, the ushers had t went to take up an offering, and they had the offering place. And as they were going uh, to the front with these offering plates, there was a small boy there, and he tugged at one of the usher ushers, and he asked him, he said, would you put the offering plate on the floor? Why would I put it on the floor? But the boy seemed insistent, so the, the usher put it on the floor. The boy stepped out of the pew and he stepped onto the plate. He stepped onto the plate. And he was communicating. It was his way of saying, I give my whole life to you, Lord. Not just the coins in my pocket, but my time, my strength, and all the days of my life. And that enthusiastic and consecrated boy was none other than Robert Moffat, who would later become the father-in-law of David Livingston would later tell Livingston, become a doctor. And he did. But he kept on preaching too, by the way. I'm glad he did. I'm sorry I didn't get to that slide. God gives us gifts of service. Gifts of service. In 1 Peter 4.10. 1 Peter 4.10. He says, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 
as God has given you grace, as he's given you love and compassion, you minister these things to other people. Whatever God has given you the grace and the ability to do, you should do it for other people. Now I want you to turn to Romans 12 with me. We're going to read just a few verses here in Romans 12 because I want to get the whole big picture of what Paul is speaking about here. Uh, so oftentimes we think about, you know, Romans is, is one of the books like with Galatians that tells us about the road to salvation. The Roman road to salvation. Well, there's a lot of truth in that. But Romans does a lot more, and particularly in Romans 12 here. Because in talking about our salvation and talking about the way of being Christians and following Christ as our pattern, I think Paul says a lot here in, in the first part of Romans chapter 12 that I'd like to share with you today. And so he says, I beseech you in Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. I can only do this by the mercies of God. You can only do this by the mercies of God. You have no power of yourself. But by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You put your body on the altar even. And become a servant for me, for, for Christ. Holy, acceptable unto God. And this, he says, is your reasonable service. It's not a sacrifice even. It's something reasonable. Something we should do. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Our minds need to be renewed, don't they? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. We think too highly of ourselves, friends. And we don't think highly of others as we ought to. You want proof of it? Watch one of the presidential debates. Just see what it's like. It's worse than a food fight at college. You know. Verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the propitiation, proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, verse 8 now, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. He says, all these things that you've been given, you are to give back and to do for others. And verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. No hypocrisy, no partiality. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And in verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. You do that, friends, through service and not expecting service from others. Christian leadership, it entails service. It entails service. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 2, Peter says, feed the flock of God. Friends, you can't do that sitting at home too easily. I mean, there is a way to do that, I suppose. I mean, you know, and here we're going back to just doing whatever we can do. There used to be a fellow who lived down in Gilbert. And every year I got a call from this guy. And he apparently was disabled. He couldn't get out and do much. But he had a phone book. Back in the days when you had phone books. And every year, he called everybody in that phone book to talk to them about Christ, to try to encourage them in the Lord. If they were a Christian, he wanted to encourage them to be a better Christian, to keep on being a Christian. If they weren't a Christian, he pled with them to give their lives to Christ. He did what he could do. He did what he could do. He was feeding the flock, if you please, in his own way. It says, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, not by force, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not for money's sake, but of a ready mind. This is what we are to do. We know that in Acts chapter 6, the Bible says that the, the apostles realized that they were doing too much physical service. Now, there's a place to do physical service, but the apostles' job primarily was spiritual. And so they said, let's... let's uh, Let's tell the people, you look out from among you, and uh, you, you choose seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, which we may appoint over this business, so we can give ourselves to the word. word. 
and they appointed them these deacons. And Stephen was one, Philip was one, he was an evangelist, right? And uh, so they had a, a, a great work to do, and we have a work to do too. So my question to you today is, do you really want to be like Christ? Do you really want to be like Christ? You know, we, we think about Christ, we want that street of gold, we want those gates of pearl, we want those white shiny robes, great and good of itself. But really, to be like Christ means to be a servant above all things, to be holy and to be a servant. Paul sort of sums this up in Philippians chapter 2, and in verse 2, he says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And the way to esteem others better than, the, better than yourselves, friends, is to serve others. To serve others. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I know Brother Alan Yule was pretty busy this last week. He had a lot going on. But you know, our neighbor down here needed some wood, and he made it a point to go find some wood for that neighbor. That's putting, your, putting other people ahead of yourself. That's what Christ is calling us to do day by day. When David Livingston sailed for Africa for the first time, he had a, a group of friends accompany him to the pier to wish him bon voyage, you know, good, good, good journey, good voyage. But there were some of them who were concerned for his safety, um, and rightfully so, and they reminded him of the dangers which would confront him in Africa, which at that time was called the Dark Continent, Dark Land, you know, was sort of a little more primitive, we might say, in some respects. Um, in fact, one man urged Livingston to remain in England, urged him very strongly. But in response, Livingston opened his Bible and he read aloud the portion of the Lord's last recorded words in Matthew's Gospel in uh, chapter 28. He says, Lo, I'm with you always. Lo, I'm with you always. And he looked at his friends and he says, That, my friend, is the word of a gentleman. Let's, let us be going. Livingston said, and I quote him, I never made a sacrifice. We ought not to talk of sacrifice when we remember the great sacrifice that he made who left his father's throne high to give himself for us. And interestingly today, in Westminster Abbey, where all these supposedly great people are buried, mm -hmm. the one buried in the most preeminent place, right by the altar, is David Livingston, minus his heart, because his heart was left in Africa literally and figuratively, and buried there. But he was simply trying to follow the footsteps of his master, or the pattern that was set before him. And that's what I want to do today. And if I have any epithet ever on my grave, or, or memorial, or whatever, because I, I probably won't ever have a grave, I just want it to be, he was a servant. He was God's servant. And I want that to be your appetite, too. I want it to be your life to be a servant of Christ.